This episode is proudly supported by Open Table. Nearly one third of diners are booking same day. So they're making those decisions on the spot. And 10% are, do- are making their bookings within just a few hours. And so it's why it's so important to have you know, booking software like Open Table, which allows your diners to discover you. And so when restaurants are on platforms like Open Table, they're much more likely to be discovered. We help diners to connect to restaurants. Ultimately, having technology, using technology, helps you to reattach to those diners. Experience the power of Open Table. For an exclusive offer, visit restaurant.opentable.com.au forward slash DITW. One day, the the sous chef and I got the courage up to ask him if we could um, if we could buy a Kenwood to do the souffles because we were doing like twenty five souffles a day by hand. So anyway, we get the courage up. Hey, Greg, can we can we buy a, a Kenwood so that we can make souffles quicker? And he looked at the two of us and said, "Sure, you can do that. Which one of you wants to leave?" <laughs> and we were just like, "Oh yeah, maybe we'll just keep whisking those." This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Influence can come from many things. Inspiration can set someone off on a journey and set them apart from their contemporaries. Commitment over decades can leave a mark, not only on our culinary history, but all that have been enlightened by that dedication too. There are some hospitality professionals that show never-ending energy, commitment and enthusiasm to continually raise the bar, expectation and add colour to the offering over many decades. Peter Kuravita is one of Australia's most influential chefs and the owner of soon-to-be-opened Alba by Kuravita. Peter, how are you? I'm fantastic, thank you, Anthony. It's good to have you on the show. Four decades into your career and you're about to open another venue. <laughs> Where do you get the drive and enthusiasm from? I was, um, it's funny, it's funny because I kind of relate a little bit of that story uh, just today to a young chef who's worked with Tets and worked with Rockpool and um, want, wants to come on board with me. And would, and I was, he had no idea what Tetsu was doing when I was. Tets and I got our first hats together back in the day, but um, I started mine in 1979 as a young boy, and um, I've always, I'm getting to your to your question here, and that is that from that moment, um, there were many things that drove me when I stepped over that threshold of the local suburban restaurant with the smell of oil, and you know when a restaurant's not quite awake yet, where it's got the leftovers from the night before, and I, I remember it to the day I die, I stepped over that threshold and things passed through a 16-year-old boy's mind that probably shouldn't have, and that was, I want to be an executive chef in a hotel, I want to travel the world, I want to own my own restaurant, Um, I don't ever want to go backwards, I want to keep rising, and I know how hard this job is, so I will never stop until um, I'm, I'm content and happy with what I do. And my last thing, which is my credo still today is, be consistent, be good at what you do and love it because if you don't, it's point, it's a waste of life. <laughs> Man, this is a hard job, but I still love it. I still absolutely enjoy it and love it. Well, I want to get to that threshold in a moment that you speak of, but tell us, tell us about the influence of food and the role it played in your family as a kid. I think it was everything. It was absolutely everything, you know. Every, kids have memories. Mine seem to be very deep and started at a very young age and most were influenced by food. But I guess it's having a family of storytellers as well and having a family of people who were absolute adventurers and travelled and having a mother and a father from the total opposite sides of the world, cuisine, culture, religion, you name it, colour, everything. And uh, that, that that's, where, that's where food was and that's what food meant to me. My earliest food memory my dad was an engineer and uh he had a little um little garage in london where um he was mates with quite a few of the lords and ladies of england he used to repair all their cars and cars and as a little boy uh, i always used to look forward to my father coming home and feeding me a little ball of rice with dal curry 
with his fingers and the memory that sticks in my mind even today are a couple of things. One was incredibly rough fingers and the other one was the <laughs> slight smell of diesel. So I was chroming from the age of about three. <laughs> what was it that led to the thoughts of being a, a chef? Oh, my father told me if I don't go and get a job, he'll kick me out of the house. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's the short story. The long story is that he saw that I loved it. He saw that food um, was a real fascination for me. And, you know, growing up in Sri Lanka, when we came, when we left London at the age of four and, you know, drove across the world to get to Sri Lanka, um, that kitchen in, in, in our house, which is still standing, it's now nearly 300 years old, um, was the heart, it was the heartbeat, it was the center, it was the, the hospital, the, the healing room, the, you know, the psychiatric room, the whole thing, because in that, from that black kitchen, we used to call it, because everything was wood fired. So the entire kitchen was covered in soot with this big, beautiful, large wooden open fireplace and all the big earthenware clay hat hatties above the fireplace for the ceremonies and the festivals that used to happen. But that kitchen was where I sat and just watched in awe from the age of four till the age of 12, my grandmother and her two daughters and a few house girls working and, you know, crossing the road to our polar, to the market. And um, these ladies taking me, you know, they'd be in their, in their normal, uh, house clothes but then as my old man used to say you had to be well turned out to walk across the road even and literally the market was across the road but but my aunties and grandmother would get dressed in their best sari to open the back gate and go across the road to go shopping and the thing that i guess the fascination there was my um i was always or always fascinated with food and all the different things but whenever i asked them a question the answer was never replied, you know, what's that Archie or what's that grandmother? And the never, answer was never, oh, this is, you know, a drumstick. The answer would be, well, the drumstick leaves are very good for your hair and, the, you know, the drumsticks are great for your indigestion. So food had a me like a deep meaning from, from day one. And my, when everyone, all the men went off to work and the women went off to work, my grandmother would have assessed everyone that morning. And then we'd go at the age of four, I'd hold her co corner of her sari and we'd cross the road and we'd shop for the health of the family. We wouldn't shop, go, oh, going to the supermarket, feel like a steak. She wouldn't, like, if I had a cold, I wasn't really, uh, allowed to eat a mango because a mango is cooling, can't have mangoes. So you'd have to, you know, and everything was tied to Ayurveda, ancient practices and, um, you know, a bit of herbal medicine. And then my mum came along, a Viennese girl with all the modern medicine and, you know, Panadol's made their way into the into the diet as well. And some of the modern medicines, which, you know, didn't quite work with the older ones uh, combined. And so it was it was daily. It was every every meal, every moment, you know, sitting. I remember these ladies because the unscrupulous sellers, the market people would always try and get a few more rupees from weighing down whatever it is. And mostly it was rice because it was very easy to grind a bit of a little granite rocks through the rice and get make it weigh a little bit more, but that obviously caused broken teeth. So every morning, it was a morning ritual. The men would go, the women would go to the well, have their bath, and they'd be sitting there with their hair drying in the sun, nattering away, and on this big basket, like a cane woven basket, which they used to weave, they'd put the 10 cups of rice for the family that day, and they would sort through grain by grain to find the little bits of granite in there so that no one broke their teeth. And I'd just sit there and listen to them and talk to them and, and hear what they had to say. And it was daily. Daily was food, life, vitality. So without me even knowing it, it was deeply entrenched in me. My father knew it. And when we got to Australia, I, I had to fight for my life. A little brown boy turning up into one year post white Australia policy into the southern suburbs of, or western suburbs of Sydney was a fight. Every single day was a fight. And, uh, I, I, you know, everything that I, I had and everything that I held so deeply in Sri Lanka and, you know, they've all come back now, which is wonderful. But then it was, it was just like, I said to my mum, because when we got to Sri Lanka, or when we got to Australia, I was, I was speaking four languages. I was speaking Tamil to the butcher's son across the road. My mum spoke to me in German all the time. 
school was English and my aunties were in Singala and my dad spoke to me in English, but everybody else spoke to me in Singala. And you'd swap effortlessly through them. But when we got there, I remember saying to my dad, just don't, none of you talk to me in any other language. It's hard enough. And so I've still got some of those language skills in, in probably understanding. But anyway, so all of this had happened and the trauma had happened and I wanted to leave school. And so 15 and nine months was when I was allowed to leave school. And my father didn't want it. Educated people, engineers, pilots, you know, scientists, Montessori teachers, whatever. A, a very smart family. And, and I'm, you know, I still don't think that you need to go to school to prove that you're smart. But, you know, for them, it was a big thing that I was going to not even going to finish year 10. Um, and I just said, I want to leave. I can leave. I'm going to leave. So my father said to me, well, OK, you can leave, but let's find you a job. And he had... By this stage, we, I'd never seen a tradesman in my life. Everything that was done in that house was done by us. Um, and and it was, I think it was a fibro house. So I'm sure there was a bit of, you know, a bit of asbestos in there too. But we cut things. We, made, we, we did all the drains. We did the electrical work. My dad was an engineer, so we were constantly repairing cars. And my dad just kept just said to me, you can do all of these. You're good at all of them. And I was like, Dad. I've been doing it since I was 12. It's like I've, I've already had a career in, in the trades. I'm not really interested anymore. I don't want to get my hands dirty. And, you know, our plumbing was never the best. So, so there was always, um, always, son, can you just dig that hole up? Remember the one that going to the toilet? It needs unblocking again. So I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to be a plumber. I was playing in my, in my own family's wastes for too long to even think about playing in anyone else's. And so, so um, we're driving down a local suburb, Mortdale, in Sydney, near Oatley, and um, Dad just stopped the car and he just looked at me and said, you like cooking, don't you? And I was like, well, I guess so. And and I've never had to cook. They never made me cook at home. But he said, you used to love it with your grandmother. And I said, yeah, that was a long time ago, Dad. And he said, there's a restaurant there. Go and ask for a job. And I seriously thought he was joking. I just said no. And he said, right, get out of the car. You can sleep on the streets for a couple of days and we'll see what, how you like that. And so I thought, well, okay, I'll go and ask for a job. And I knocked on the door. A young chef called Scott Milray in the Crabapple restaurant in Mortdale opened the door, and that smell was there. That was, that was the moment. Uh, because a big night out for us, we had no money. So sometimes mum would buy one turkey leg to share between us. And I reckon this turkey was a dinosaur. Like, I, I'll never, I'll, still today, I'll never forget it. It was the biggest leg I'd ever seen in, my, in the world. And the tendons were the size of my finger. I think we only bought turkey leg once and we all realized it was terrible. But our big night out for a restaurant was the local Chinese at the RSL with the little flaming Bunsen burner of uh, metho next to the lemon chili uh, chicken. And, you know, that was, a, that was a big deal for us. Chicken in a basket was something I craved and mum and dad could never afford to buy me. You know, but we ate, we, we ate like royalty at home. My mum's Austro-Hungarian you know, background. She used to make phyllo by herself. She still today makes all the Christmas cakes. Her, her, you know, pressure cooker peppers stuffed with rice and mints are just still today. I just crave them and I love them. And, and then dad, dad retired early. He just said, I've had enough at 52. He just came home one day. So that's it. I'm done. Repaired cars, had a secondhand shop and cooked and tried to replicate all his, all his mother's flavors. And, and so, yeah, there was, there was beautiful food at home all the time. A special, you know, takeaway was possibly we'd share a three-piece bucket from Kentucky Fried or something. But anyway, so I get to this place and the young chef, Scott Milray, I, I told him the story. My dad's in the car. He said, I have to ask you for a job. Um, if not, I have to sleep on the street. Do you need anyone? <laughs> that, was my first, that was my first ever job interview. And he looked at me and he was a cool guy. We became good friends. And he said, well, my family and I were talking about getting an apprentice. We're just starting to get busy. So I walked in and there was the whole family, mum, dad, the sister, the brother and their partners. And in the back room was a, a couple of kids. Um, and I was just a kid as well. So I came in, they put a knife in my hand, which was just, you know, I was just like, yes, I like this job. And I, my first job was cutting and buttering garlic bread. And after about two hours, 
of doing that and a few other things. They said, oh, you must be tired. Go, I said, no, 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 I'm fine. So I worked a couple more hours. And in those days, old Scotty used to have a cigarette in his mouth. So you'd be, he'd be cooking the, you know, the pepper steak and get the, all, the, all the Madeira. What was that? Veal masala. That's it. Get the, get the flame in the veal masala. And when it was finished, he was a good cook too. The food was delicious. He'd take his cigarette out of his mouth, just ash it, put it on the side of the bench, serve it up, then put it back next order. You know, we made lobster thermidor and it was a good old school French cook. Anyway, so we get to, the, get to about three hours and they said, you've done enough. Just, you know, you've got a job. We'd love to offer you a job. And I was stoked. It was like, and I loved it. Immediately, instantly just thought, I love this. And I went outside and my dad was still there. And, uh, yeah, it's still very emotional. <sighs> but that's where I started. And I haven't looked back since. I've traveled. I've been head chef. I've been executive chef in, a, in hotels. My head, I remember I got, after 9-11, everything went really quiet. And um, I did, I did uh, the Olympics. And after that, I got made redundant and I sat there and we got down to our last, last mortgage payment. And uh, I was still looking for work. And this guy, Karan Singh, he's still around um, from a hospitality agency. He said, oh, Hayman Island's looking for someone else. Thinking, God, that's a big job. So I said to dad, I think I might have a job at Hayman Island as the executive chef. And he was like, perfect. And I said, what am I going to do? He said, don't worry, son. Many, many people will come and try and tell you how good they are. So once you get the job, you go in there and you sit in that office and people will come and they'll try and say, hey, this is how we do this and this is how we do that. And you'll learn very quickly. You're a very smart boy. And so that's exactly what I did. I walked into this place, 120 chefs, 45 kitchen hands, nine restaurants, two 24-hour room service kitchens. And I had never – and and – all logistics. So you got to barge once a week. If you messed up, they flew stuff in. Um, so yeah, I, I, look, I, I love it, I guess. That was the longest answer in the world, but I still love it. I still do. It's crazy. You, you cut your teeth in um, with some incredible chefs as well, like um, Greg Doyle and Peter Doyle and um, Neil Perry at Blue Water Grill as well. Tell us about some of the highlights. Do you have any stories from working with those chefs? Plenty. Well, okay. So, so after Crabapple, that was, you know, another progression plan from Crabapple was continue to learn. And so I got to second year and I said to Scott, I'm, I'm going to go. And in those days you look for your jobs in the Sydney morning Herald and uh, in the job section, which was thicker than the rest of the newspaper in those days. And uh, I saw just one line, second year apprentice phone number. So called the number. And it was um, some chef on the phone said, come in for an interview, two o'clock. So he gave me the address. It was Riley Street, Darlinghurst. Come in and I walk up this dirty old laneway and there's three chefs sitting on an Alfa Romeo spider. The garbage room is just flowing out with beer bottles and stuff. And I was thinking, Jesus, what kind of place is this? It was Rogue's Restaurant, which was like one of the biggest nightclubs. I think the other one, what was the other one called? Um, uh, there was rogues, and, and I'll remember it along the way. But so, and then flashy young chef comes in, uh, walks down the aisle. It was his. It was his Alfa Romeo. And we had some amazing days in that Alfa Romeo. I can tell you, going to the Hunter Valley and stuff. But so I walk in this restaurant, and I really did not know what the prestige that I would just walked into, um, and and the reputation that that place had. Not only as the wildest nightclub in Sydney for the richest people in Sydney, but also his restaurant was incredible and Greg's food was incredible. Um, and I, I really hadn't seen that sort of quality produce before. I broke my nose. I remember we had a competition at Crabapple. We'll see how many blocks of scallops can you break with your head? I got, to, I got to four and then broke my nose. So, you know, it was very different from, you know, putting a, a, a Burmese barramundi fillet that weighed 20 kilos into the bathtub in the backyard at Crabapple to seeing Martin, Martin from Martin Seafood turn up with scallops the size of 50 cent coins and the most freshest fish and, you know, just incredible produce. So I, I, there was three of us. 
um, including Greg and a kitchen hand. And we did 90 people. It was hard work. Greg was brutal. He, t- he, he used to enjoy um, whacking me quite often, um, especially when mates like um, Michael McMahon used to come around. So Michael McMahon was selling wine for Len Evans. And we always used to look for Minogue's, um, look forward to his trips because um, whenever he turned up, he just had us in stitches. He had the best stories, best stories in the world. And they were always absolutely hilarious. But, um, but that place, okay, one of the funniest stories I think is um, one day the, the sous chef and I got the courage up to ask him if we could, um, if we could buy a Kenwood to do the souffles because we were doing like 25 souffles a day by hand while doing everything else. You know, he'd look at your tart cases and you had to see through them. If they were, if you couldn't see through them, he'd throw them out. And it was, it was hardcore. It was a great, great learning time. Lots of hard work. You worked your butt off, but you got it done. And, and I don't know, there was always a satisfaction. So anyway, we get the courage up. Hey, Greg, can we, can we buy a, a Kenwood so that we can make souffles quicker? And he looked at the two of us and said, Sure, you can do that. Which one of you wants to leave? <laughs> and I was just like, oh, yeah, maybe we'll just keep whisking those. Um, you know, that, that, that restaurant had all Lee Brennan, the colonel at the front, and then all these other people. You know, the, they only hired models, so these beautiful girls and women walking around all the time. I literally had two white T-shirts and my chef's pants, and then Greg would hand us down stuff too. He'd always give us his leftover clothes. So that was the only thing we had, had to, oh, anyway, I had to wear, but my life was pretty much going in there, coming back home. And in between that, if I could, um, I'd help Pete um, at reflections. And then after that, he was in, I think it was called turrets in the city on Sundays. Um, Mark Armstrong at, um, at uh, Pegram's on a Friday lunch um, Anders at Yellow Book. Um, so I, I tried to keep myself as busy as possible while being the crazy Sydney young chef of the 80s, you know, and I, and I just tried to learn as much as possible. That was the most important thing to me. And there's so many stories. God, I, I, one day I'll write it all down. But most all positive, um, you know, along the way there was you, – you saw how chefs got um, – who fell by the wayside. I saw, you know, like Steve Hodges, Steve Hodges came after me at, um, at Polini. So once Greg finished at door, uh, at rogues, then he had a bit of a spell where he was looking for a new business. And I said, Oh, I, and he asked me if, he, if I wanted to join him. I said, sure. But it was quite a spell. It was like nearly six months, I think. And in that time, I worked at Tony's. I don't know whether you remember this, Anthony, but Tony's was in Double Bay and he was a gangster. I think his name was Tony. Oh, I can't remember. But he got he got Tony Eustace maybe. I'm not sure. But he got killed in the restaurant while we were cooking by a hitman. And then there was another another little Italian restaurant. I can't remember the name of it. It was pumping in Double Bay. And it was just myself and this Italian lady in her 50s who made the most delicious food. And so we do Sunday lunch together, 150 people just cooking pasta. And she was that classic Italian telling you, you know, every dish had to be perfect. You had to taste it all. Um, and I just worked for as many people as, as much as I could until we opened Polini's. And then John Pegram came in and he was the manager. Um, and Polini started in Neutral Bay. And Greg, um, on the day we were supposed to open, Greg's son, Matt, was born who had a few medical problems. And so Greg disappeared. So for the first the first um, week of the new restaurant, I think I ran it by myself. And the first day, it's like, okay, Greg's not here. We're going to do it. First day, I was chopping carrots for, for a stock and I chopped like a good, I would say, a fifth of the top of my finger off and... I thought, oh, bloody hell, the piece of meat was still on the board. Threw the piece of meat away. Didn't realise that if you put it on, it stops bleeding Didn't at that stage. Threw it in the bin, washed the board, put a rubber glove on, put some tape on it, kept going. And then the blood started coming out of the glove. And so I had to go out the back and wash that off. And, and they were going, you've got to go. You've got to go to the hospital. So I said, no, I'm not going to go. We've got to, we've got to rest on so it. Taped it up again. Same thing. This time I looked at it and passed out. But after I passed out, I actually woke up feeling better. St- 
stemmed the blood and off we went. And that was, <laughs> that was our first service, I think, at Polini's. Um, yeah, it was, there's so many stories. There's so many gr great stories of, of, you know, camaraderie, hard work, um, passion about food, um, hilarious things we did. Like three of us lived in the same house and we all um, worked in the same place, but every day we'd race each other from home, from Bondi to Darlinghurst, Bondi to Darlinghurst. So like God knows how we all survived all of that stuff. And in the meantime, I was actually um, – so at the age of about 14 when I was really, really angry and school was really, really nasty, um, I – my dad had a jewellery shop in Taylor Square in Darlinghurst. And so I used to go and hang with him on my days or, or like or after school or on the, on the Saturday. And, and I'd always go wondering. And Darlinghurst in those days was pretty sketchy. Um, in 1970, you know, 73, 74, 75, it was, it was still the time of all the gangsters and everything. And uh, so I, I'd wander further and further. I found a couple of pool halls and billiard halls that I'd play, and all, always by myself, a bit of a loner. And then I wandered down and I ended up near Chinatown, and that intrigued me. So I kept going, and in Chinatown, I saw a little sign saying Kung Fu. And I, because my, mom, my mum's a brown belt at judo, my dad was an Olympic wrestler, so sport was always in our, in our life. Anyway, so I walked up these stairs and I looked through the window and there was a little martial arts gym with a teacher training. His name's Chan Chuck Fei. Um, the gym was called Double Dragon Kung Fu. I, I've still got my membership card. I think I'm number 66 and uh, it, it is now, it's, it's in all over Australia. But anyway, so Chuck Fei took me in and I started training all the time. And that was my sanity and my balance between going totally off the edge, which was easy to do as a chef. There was, everything was there. Everything you, you wanted and didn't want was being pushed on you and was there to be had if you wanted. And the thing that saved me, I think, was that martial arts background. And so, yeah, all the way through that, I was very fit. And I was fighting in the ring as well. So there were times I'd come to work and have a broken rib or a black eye. Or, and it, but it kept me, it kept me, how do I explain this? I was really angry, like, and it kept me from hurting other people unnecessarily when I was allowed to hurt people in the ring. And I was pretty good at it. So that was, my, that was the balance, you know. In, at night, I'd be, I'd be cooking for people, and during the day and on once every six weeks, I'd get in the ring and beat the hell out of someone. So it was, it was, it was a good balance. Um, uh, I kept fit, kept sane, didn't hurt anyone, and uh, still could keep doing my craft. You spent, you spent time at Blue Water Grill and Baron, jo Baron Joey House and Bilson's. What, 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 was the, what would have been the real influences on you before having your own restaurants? Oh, well, to see these entrepreneurs. So, okay, so I finished my apprenticeship. Um, the day after I finished my apprenticeship, I, I got on a plane and I went overseas. I didn't come home for three years. Um, a year I spent backpacking around Asia then I went to London and did the, the thing and, you know, tried to work in as many places as possible, but eventually gave up on the whole trying to be the stage in the Michelin restaurants. And Greg has taught me so well. This is, I think, something I need to go back to and to ensure that if anyone, you know, listens. Greg Doyle taught me so well. When I got to London, I thought, what are these jokers doing? Like, I remember it was the, it was the era of Mussolini's. We just had to make them. You had no time to test them and stuff. So, and Greg, some of the dishes still today were just stunning, simple, stunning dishes. And um, I was in this one, I think it was called Rue Saint-Jacques, uh, maybe, or Gastronome One, I'm not sure, but they had a Michelin star, and these guys would make a mousseline every day and test it before they made the rest. And I was like, guys, the eggs are the same, the cream's the same. The protein's the same. It's just going to work. Well, what are you bloody doing? You're wasting time. No wonder I'm here 15 hours a day. Like, it really it, it, it really did annoy me. And I, had a, I was working alongside a young Italian guy, and all we did was vegetables, like kilos and kilos of vegetables, and that was our job. Okay, one petit pois, and then you'd just saute some peas that you'd taken hours to pod, and, you know, obviously perfect with cultured butter and, you know, perfect. Perfect, the most perfect bowl of peas you've ever had in your life. And the, this little Italian guy 
the classic Italian. We had to make staff meals. So I made my mum's spaghetti bolognese. Obviously, an Austrian woman living in Australia who lived in Sri Lanka and England, I doubt that it was the same as his nonna's recipe. He, he had a go at me about it. And we had the classic. It's like, I reckon if you had witnessed it from afar, it would have been like the, the Bugs Bunny cartoons when people get into a fight and there's just dust and clouds. We beat the living crap out of each other in a Michelin star restaurant kitchen during service. Like it was on. It was on. It, did, it was relentless. And, and the chefs were just laughing. They just watched us. No one tried to stop. Anyway, so, you know, left that and I just again back to Greg Doyle he taught me so well his food was so good his techniques were so good his precision was in, uh, incredible and you know you think about his career and what he achieved and how Pier he finished with Pier on this incredible pinnacle um, yeah he was a bloody good cook and his desserts his pastry was so good too if you ever treat if you ever speak to Doyle even now you watch the way his hands move his hands are like that of a of a conductor. He's always, you know, he's very, he gesticulates so well with his hands. He speaks with his hands. So one of the things crossing that threshold was I will never go backwards, meaning I'll never go back and work for somebody that I've already worked for. I want to keep moving forward. So after this three years away, I came back and I rang Greg and said, Hey, Greg, I'm back. You know, anyone who wants to employ a employ me. And he was like, Oh, well I do. I'm going to open this new place called Pier and, you know, I've got all these other ideas. And I said, oh, no, I, I don't want to. I'm, I want to keep moving. So if there's anyone else, please tell me. And it was in Bondi, Bondi Beach, one of those back streets in an old apartment block. I plugged the phone in, the old dial phone. There's no furniture in the house, nothing. I was standing out on the balcony drinking a beer and the phone rings. It's like, hi, mate, Neil Perry. I'm just opening a restaurant in... in uh, in uh, Bondi Beach, you interested? I was like, shit, yeah, let's do it. So I went across, it was literally across. Um, and as the days and years went on, um, well, it didn't last that long. I think I, I think the whole place only lasted a year and a half, but it seemed like it was the, the forever restaurant. We used to swim across the bay until we got touched by something one night swimming home. And I guess, you know, you see, now I think about it, so we'd jump in off the rocks at Bondi and swim to the other side of the beach after doing a 12-hour shift in a seafood restaurant. Like, how stupid is that? Uh, George Sinclair, Andy Davies, John Sussman, you know, the team. Like, it was, it was the gang. Neil in his, at his peak. Um, and so I was sort of head chef. Andy Davies was under me. And then, and then uh, uh, Michael, oh God, I can't remember his name now. Anyway, there was just, oh, Katrina Ryan. Um, uh, what's her name? Yeah, anyway, there's just some incredible, incredible chefs there. So I got this phone call from uh, Neil, went across, and what that was the moment it clicked for me when I went in and thought, hang on, there's this guy. He's good, obviously, but he's cooking Asian food in the world where we're all supposed to be cooking French food because, I mean, in those days, everyone was cooking French or Italian, um, and you went for Chinese to the local RSL, or if you had enough money, you'd go to Chinatown. But no one had crossed that that barrier. You know, no one had gone from from Mod Oz, I guess, to Asian. And and Neil was the Neil was really the guy who who led that charge. Barry McDonald had underneath the Regis at Bondi had all the the old caves under there and that's where he kept all his cheese and that's when we saw king island brie come up and oh there's just it was just a wonderful time for food and drink and and as and as Ausback, i think his name was he had um he had this incredible collection of wine and it was just it was just an amazing time so when neil was started cooking Asian food for the contemporary crowd and people were lining up. They were lined up outside. Sunday lunch, there'd be, there'd be 50 people lined up out the front before you even, before you even got uh, started. So we knew what we were in for. And um, it, that's when it clicked. The little Sri Lanka to me went, hang on, I think I used to, um, I, I, I would love to learn how to bring my flavours into, into this. So I guess Neil's bold... Um, unrelenting 
enthusiasm and uh, courage. And even now, you look at Margaret. It's funny. Six months ago, I was saying, why the hell would Neil want to open another restaurant? Now look at what I'm doing. It's, it's, it's bloody ridiculous. But anyway, and, and so, so Neil, Neil was really good. I, like I, we had a really good relationship. Um, I used to love, love doing all the seafood he had. That, they were the days of those giant Angasi oysters and the cool room was just full of fish, full of the most freshest, beautiful, amazing seafood. So that really got me going. And then, you know, from there, uh, Neil Perry and Michael McMahon had a falling out over the restaurant that they started up, which um, uh, I think it was called Perry's um, in Paddington, right? And Neil, I think, just walked away saying, Michael hated him at that stage. And uh, he'd do anything to hurt Neil. So he came here for dinner, lunch one day. And then the next thing I know, I get a phone call from, from Minode going, do you want a job as head chef at Baron Joey House? Now, Neil had been... Neil had been the head chef there. Johnny Vanderveer had been the head chef there. So it was a it was a stellar lineup to follow into Baron Joey House. But um, they um, so so he took me out. He said, "I'll take you out to lunch." And so, like even even at this stage, I really wasn't a well trained diner. I really didn't. I really wasn't appreciating that. I had this silly thought in my head, and I, and it's still kind of there where I didn't like to go out too much in case people thought that I was stealing their ideas because I always wanted to think that I was, I was unique. And I, I still do that. I, I really, when I go out to eat, I go, I, I don't go to my competitors. Um, and that's bad because I should be giving them the, the business, especially in this climate. But I've always got this stupid thing in my head that just says, don't ever be blamed for copying anyone else. And I've, I've stuck by that. Anyway, so we go into, he says, I'll meet you in this place just behind George Street. And it was the Suntory. So I turn up in the rags that I normally wear. And the the, re- the restaurant manager goes, so you look bloody terrible. You need to get changed. So they gave me a, a mouldy old jacket and a mouldy old pair of pants that had been worn by another a 100 other people. And I was allowed into the restaurant. We sat down. We had tempura, like cooked perfectly by the best tempura chef. Then we ate fish off a rock, which just blew my mind. And we drank Petaluma Chardonnay because Michael loved his Petaluma Chardonnay. And he offered me the job at Baron Joey House. And so I took it and um, told Neil I'm going. I was there for six or seven months. Andrew Davies took over from me as head chef at Baron Joey House. Uh, sorry, at uh, Blue Water Grill. And off I went up to Palm Beach. And we drove, we worked three or four days a week. Had four days off, but I used to come in one day early. I, I loved and still do the market. So I did all the shopping myself and the fish markets is somewhere I lived. I love those guys and I love that Sydney fish market. And, you know, I just used to have deals with some of the buyers and I even had a buyer's card at one stage where I'd go, I'd do the walk and I'd pick boxes and write them all down and say, just buy me that box and buy me that box. So literally hand picked. Um, and, uh, so Baron Joey House is really good for that. We had an amazing time. Met, met one of my best mates, Paul Brown, who's been around the traps. He was my sous chef. Hung out with the with the LA crew, the Avalon the Avalon surfer crew. They were wild. I think it was um, uh, God a, f- a few bands there that stick out. The Violent Femmes were probably the biggest on the hit list at the time. Moby's on a Friday night after work. There was it was a wild, wild, wild time. But again just cooking good food. And Len Evans used to bring his lobsters straight off, off, I don't God knows where he got them, but he'd bring them in sacks and we'd buy sacks of Tassie crayfish. Um, there was a, there was an old man who used to scoop up uh, blue swimmer crabs and his wife used to, when we bought the, the ones that, for, that were already cooked to take the meat out, his wife would make bread dough and stick it in the holes where any of the legs had fallen off so that when they cooked them, the meat didn't get wet. And just, you know, you, you just brushed with passion all the way along and that really has, a, has a, an effect on you. I remember driving through Tassie during this same time and seeing a little sign saying, honey, leatherwood honey, and no one had heard of leatherwood honey at that stage. And I drove into this farm and this couple, this old couple, they're both passed away now, but this old couple were making, were harvesting the first leatherwood honey. And I took that to Bilson's. So 
we go from from Baron Joey House, and I, I get this hint that McMahon's up to something, and is a shifty bugger. I, like I saw him probably three months before he died. He and Judy came up here, and uh, we had a good chat. You know, Michael Michael lived hard. My God, there is a million stories I could tell about Michael, but we have. I mean, I've been up in a tree, uh, like in, in the top of a tree in Palm Beach. We're talking a massive tree. He and I, sun's rising. We can hear Judy shouting at us from, from their house up, up on the hill going, Michael, get home. And we're just in bliss up on a tree just talking about crap. You know, like we had a great time. He introduced me to Len Evans. Um, he also took me um, as the chef three times for the Single Bottle Club. I cooked at Tony Albert's house, at Len Evans's house, at Loggerheads, and then um, I did one for them at Bilson's itself. So he was he was an amazing um, influence in my life in many ways, and that's what you ask. These people, all of these people that I've just mentioned, they all just didn't give a shit. They just wanted to make. They were they were professional restaurateurs, and I love that word. Uh, and I've always aspired to 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 make that word proud, to, to be someone who runs a restaurant, who will put it all out there and will risk it all to make. And what do we do it for? In my eyes, we do it to make people happy. We do it to make it the best time of their life. And my big bugbear about hotels, they're brilliant places. They're great places of education. And in the places I was, I did it on purpose. I did it so that I could learn all their secrets. And the great thing about hotels is if you want to learn finance, you go in on your day off and you sit with the financial controller, you learn finance. Because a lot of restaurants, you don't learn all the basics, HR, finance, marketing, all of that. So my job, though it was hard and though I loved it, had an ulterior motive, which most things I've done in this career has been, and that's to improve myself so that I can be the best restaurant or I possibly can. And so the next stage was Bilson's and there was, um, so when I found out Michael was going to leave, he was going to sell my crafty bastard. He was going to sell Baron Joey house with me. And he's because he, his, his accountant, Angela was, was keen on buying the, the place. Um, Mark Ryan was my sous chef who was Katrina's husband, pig and olive. Um, and I found out and I said, what are you doing? Like, what the hell? I'm, I'm not staying. I don't care. I'll leave now. And I said, what are you doing? And he told me, oh, well, I'm going to go in as general manager of this new place called Bilson's with Tony Bilson. I said, well, Michael, you've got two choices. I'll tell Angela now I'm not staying and your, your sale will fall through or we'll go together. I'll help Ange out until, until we're ready to go. So that was the deal struck, done, and uh, I walked into Bilson's. Tony, Darren Taylor, myself. I was second under Darren. Tony Bilson was the maestro. And that was a crazy place too because Darren had just come back from France working for the Tuagoro brothers and he was mad, like intense. And we, we, had, <laughs> we had rabbits with all their fur on in the cool room. We were plucking geese out the back. We were like – but the food was, was delicious, big kitchen, you know, like it was a, it was a big place. But things were, things were probably not as um, – they weren't peaceful, put it that way. Tony, Tony, uh, unfortunately, was probably drinking a little bit too much and mostly of other people's w uh, wines. It was funny. I, I used to love hanging out with Tony. He, was, he, was a, he had an incredible passion, incredible knowledge. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't know him personally during the Kinsella times. When, when my dad had, the, had the, the jewelry shop, Kinsella's was still a funeral parlour. So that's that's a long time ago, and then then you know they cleaned it up, and it became it became Tony and Darren um, and Kinsellas, which was an incredible another incredible um, thing that that was started and changed the the face of Sydney's you know landscape, I guess, when it came to fine dining and food and all the rest of it. Um, so yeah, Bilson's was again surrounded by incredible people, but one person other than Michael, Michael and I used to sit next to each other after every service and probably drink a bottle or two of bottle or two of wine every night of good wine and you know talk crap and you know have a have a laugh about the day and try and work out what was going to happen and it was I, did you ever go in there 
well, you probably have since that that stainless steel wall. It was it was it was stainless steel mesh for straining jet fuel through. George Freeman did it. I think I think that wall was a hundred grand. Like in those days, that was a lot of money. Um, and anyway, it was the wall that we got the stars to sign. So I cook, like there's, the list goes on. So Pudi Ustinov is my, one of my favourites because my dad loved him so much. I held Kylie Minogue by the waist and lifted her up as high as I possibly could so she could sign up top because she was going, look, everyone signed in the bottom. So I lifted her up and raised her above my head and she signed, she signed right at the top. Michael Hutchins, I think, came in with every single one of his girlfriends. Um, King and Queen of Sweden, Norway, Thailand, blah, blah, blah. You know, Mick Jagger, Jerry Hall. Um, it was really nice to cook for Paul McCartney and Linda McCartney. She, she, she was a vegan. And so I cooked her this incredible vegan meal and she loved it. And we had a long chat afterwards. I, there wasn't a days when you'd had photos together. I don't know what happened there. But anyway, and you don't need them sometimes. It's better in your mind. Anyway, she sent me her book. She had a cookbook and she said, dear Tony, thank you very much. And I was so pissed off. I don't have the book anymore, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I should have kept it now thinking about it, but I was so angry. I was like, what? But that, that was the progression, you know. It was just one incredible entrepreneur after another who was willing to whisk, risk it all. And the person at the end of the line that stabilised me, and I stayed there for seven and a half years as a head chef, um, was Leon Fink. Leon Fink used to just, his favourite words were, Peter, if you save it here, he goes straight to the bottom line with his, with his little cigar. And, you know, he taught me the finer parts of how to make money in a restaurant. There's only little bits and pieces here and there that you even have an opportunity to get a hold of when it comes to cash in a restaurant. And he taught me how to, how to gather those and let them drop to the bottom line so that you could have a profit. So he re And he was, from, from the day... I was there for seven years. We'd have a meeting and he was in those meetings nearly every single time when his father got sick or he had stuff to do. But generally he was there at every meeting and he would always have great words of advice. And when I finished up, he took me up to the Koala Motor Inn. I think he owns that building or the top of it anyway. And we had a long chat and he was very generous with me and just said, look, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate everything you've done and good luck. And I'm still in touch with him. And, you know, that, that if, if I saw him tomorrow, we'd just keep talking the way we always were. And like John Fink, John Fink, I think we did his 16th birthday party there. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of a lot of history there and a lot of cool stuff that, that went on. But those people motivated me to to continue to strive. But if I didn't love it, I wouldn't do it. There's so many things in your career that we could talk about. Well, we probably need a 10 part series to get into it. Um, but flying fish is such a huge part of your life and such an impact on Sydney's dining scene. Do you have any fond memories of, of that time? Yeah, plenty. That, that was really a really amazing growing uh, period because I was head chef, uh, exec chef at Heyman, got a phone call by Yosie Fest. What a now, that's a character. Can you remember? Do you ever meet Yosi Fest? He was a character and a half. He was sort of like this wheeler dealer that that was in between and he was always there. He was always in restaurants and he was, I don't know. Anyway, he brokered the deal of the selling uh, of the business, of the property, and he connected Michael McCann from Dreamtime Australia with Condides. So those two got together and was like, what do we do for a chef? And Yosi said, what about Kuravita? He's up there in... In Heyman. So I got a phone call from Yossi. I just had a shoulder reconstruction, so I flew down. Um, I, I'd stopped fighting by then, but <laughs> I think the, the injuries, I, I stopped, my, my last fight was 33. So, um, yeah, but my, my body has, it's still paying for it. But anyway, flew down to Sydney, met this tall, lanky Greek man who, again, um, you know, I could say good and bad things about him, but the good thing is that he's an entrepreneur, and uh, he came from. You know, he grew up in the in the kitchen of a of an RSL where his dad was a was a cook. Um, he he came from Greek Greece to be a to be a um, 
He was a policeman, left Greece, came to Australia, was playing cards with his mates at some RSL or, or workers club and the, the chef walked out and the GM said, can any of you cook? And so his dad did, Stavros. And he was, uh, he was a hard-ass old, old school Greek man, but he just got good food. And so uh, Con and his sister would finish school and come and go to the club and they'd do their homework in the kitchen or in the office or whatever. So he, Con grew up with all of that. So anyway, so I meet this guy, savvy when it comes to restaurants, but, but probably not of the level that he was aspiring to, which was what Flying Fish was. So I basically said to him, look, I'm, I'm, I'm done with working for people, um, but I, I really wanted, I'm interested in this position, but I want a partnership. And so that's where we kind of struck that deal and that partnership. And I recommend it to anyone to cut, cut someone into it because they've worked their ass off, even if it's a small percentage. And it's well worth it in, in the long run, especially if you've got someone with all the knowledge that you need to open a new business um, of that caliber. And so I just set to it. I got myself an office by myself. And I built that restaurant from bottom up, employed all the staff. And that's what, that was my deal with him. It's like, it's this. After five years, I get this. Um, you guys, and, and they actually said, he and his wife said, we, we don't want to be known as the owners because they didn't want to have, they, they didn't want the risk of failing. You know, it's all right. like if I failed, if it hadn't have worked, well, you know, then that no one would have known that it was them that wanted to do it. So I took it all on my shoulders, but it was, I'm confident. It's what I wanted to do. And it, I could see the value. I mean, you're standing there looking at the back of the Harbour Bridge. That was number one. People were saying it's in the middle of nowhere. How are you going to, no one will ever come. They came. Um, and so part of that was, um, and, and at, in the Bilson's days, when I started to think, oh, you know, not enough people know me. And the thing was that Tony Bilson's name was always attached to Bilson. So who the hell is Peter Curavita? And I think a lot of young chefs probably face this. I paid somebody for five months at $5,000 a month in those days um, to promote me and to get my name known. And it was, it was hard and it was, well, I mean, I was just blowing the money anyway, so it didn't really matter. It was good to spend it on something good. But, but it was, it was it, it, so that got me the recognition and that, that helps chefs and entrepreneurs along the way um, and restaurateurs, of course. Um, so we started, I had that, and the first thing I did was employed a press, per, press person and said, let's get someone to try and follow this because it is at, the stay, at that stage the most expensive restaurant build so far. I think Ampersand took over that just after we opened. But let's let's get into this and get someone to follow. So we had someone who was catching up with me once every fortnight. And of course that place went three months over. over. We missed Christmas, we missed New Year, we missed everything. We finally opened on uh, Australia Day 2003, about five months late. So in that time, I had a lot of time to prepare and get this place up and perfect and ready to roll. Um, and we opened with a bang. We did all the chefs. I brought all the chefs with me. So if you think about, you know, Corey Costello, head chef of Rockpool Group, um, Luke Tchaikovsky, who's moved here now and has a, a, a pumping bar called Village Bicycle. There was a stellar group of people that I brought. So I went to Sydney when, when, I, when, I, when I took over Hayman Island, there were a lot of chefs there who'd been there for way too long. And so I cleared the decks and, you, and then I went around Sydney and uh, I can't say it because it's too big a swear, swear word, but I took, I took um, Martin Boat's best chef and I remember walking into the restaurant. His name was Hansel Martinez. I remember walking into the restaurant to have lunch, coming back from uh, Hayman one day and Boatsy's at the front. He goes, Kuravita, you, you stole my Hansi. Like, full, that was it. It wasn't like, hey, Pete, how are you going? Everybody in the restaurant heard it. He just screamed it at me. Um, so I took him. I took the head pastry, the head cake designer of Sweetheart. I took pretty much everyone from Catalina. Um, I got a three-hat guy from Italy, uh, from uh, Adelaide to do the Italian restaurant. Tony Kelly, who now has a very successful restaurant group up here. Um, so we had a stellar lineup of people. And when I went to, when I opened uh, Flying Fish, some of those guys came with me and I, and I had this deal with them. And I said, look, I, we're running out of money. I can't afford to pay you. What, what I'd love you to do is go and get any job 
anything you like and I'll make up the difference. And so they all did and it was cool. They all went out. Some of them got dumbass jobs that, you know, they, they've always dreamed of getting but never thought they would. Just stupid, you know, just the, some of them did some, some hilarious stuff, you know, pushing trolleys in hospitals and like just it's like whatever. Um, and then we opened. We opened with a bang and, and the memories just, you know, there's, there's some funny memories. Like we were, on a, we were on a wharf, right, and the Australian native um, – water rat is as big as as big as a cat and i battled those guys for two years where i used to go to the restaurant because what they love seafood obviously and i had tanks of 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 crabs and lobsters uh boxes of yabbies and these guys would go in and they would just chew the legs off the mud crabs or they'd eat the yabbies and so for two years i used to go into the restaurant in the middle of the night and watch and you'd see troops of them and I'd try and block the holes and then I'd realise they'd just gnaw their way through. Then I realised that if you put, you know, that filler stuff with steel wool, they didn't like it because it chewed on it. I, I know more about rats than anyone I can tell you right now. Two years later, I got rid of them all. I even had, I even had to have holes cut in the upside, upstairs floor because once I'd managed to poison these buggers, then they purposely died in the floor. So then you couldn't use the upstairs for two days. So I thought, no, nah, they're not going to beat me. So I got beautiful holes cut in there and I'd go in the morning and I'd, I could sniff them out and then you'd get a hook and you'd pull the dead rat out and off you go. And the ones you couldn't find, I'll just tell you, after five days they stop smelling, but it's a, it's a, it's a very terrible five days that you have to endure. Tell us about your, your food and how much it changed during that time with Flying Fish. Yeah, it did a lot. It did a lot. That was the real, that was the defining moment, I think. Boathouse Black Wattle Bay was was doing that famous uh, snapper pie. We were I, I was I had experimented a lot during Baron Joey House, not so much during uh, Bilson's because we were trying to be more French. Um, and I just thought this is the moment. This is the moment we can do this. And um, it was about taking Sri Lankan food to the next level, but not turning into a Sri Lankan restaurant. So the flavors are delicious. Sri Lankan food is absolutely amazing. It has some of the most, and this goes all the way back to these three ladies in the kitchen. It has some of the most um, incredible and intense flavors without being ridiculously spicy and without being ridiculously uh, unhealthy. So it's actually a very healthy cuisine. And I, I was trying to figure out how I'm going to marry those two into this environment where the whole of Sydney wanted to come and drink fine wine and, you know, eat mud crabs. And so the snapper curry was born out of that. And the, the idea was that, you know, if you buy a piece of fish in Sri Lanka, you've got to cook it in a sauce because you're not really sure how long it was on the beach or on the shelf or whatever for. And I, I, I truly believe that, that, you know, curries were created originally when there was no refrigeration to kill bacteria and to, to get rid of toughness. So it was the opposite for me. It was it was the most beautiful fish. It was a, it was a eight count ruby snapper from New Zealand. And we went through millions of them to the stage where I was thinking, how sustainable is this? You know? And, and that's when all the sustainability talks started coming up as well. But anyway, um, and then I, then the curry that I started off with. So when I got from London to Colombo, uh, my, the, my heat tolerance was pretty much zero. And so my grandmother used to make me this beautiful, rich, aromatic fish curry sauce. And that is the, still the same recipe that I'm using. That curry, that curry is now 20, 20 years old, uh, 21 years old um, as, as the dish. And uh, when I left, when I left um, Noosa Beach House last month, we were still year on year, 50% of every single main course that went out the door was that dish. So that was a, that was a winner. Um, but there was a few others, a mud crab, a couple of sauces, you know, a, a trip to Singapore and a, a disappointing Singapore um, chili crab ended up me just going into the back storeroom and with a pen and paper and throwing 15 ingredients together and turning up with the sauce. And this is Bilson. So this is pre, this is 1996. Um, and that sauce is still being used with exactly the same recipe with mud crabs now and people just love it. So my food evolved into... Tasty, spicy, fresh, local, I guess that's what you call it. Um, and it's, it's food that people love to eat. It may not always be food that I love to cook, but I think 
if you want to run a successful business, you have to have a balance between the two. It's obvious that you need food that you love and that you have a story and a connection to, but it's also very important that people who come into the restaurant have something to eat. So like at, at Flying Fish, it was a seafood restaurant, but my goal was that we had to have one chicken and one meat dish on that was stunning because if a party of 10 people came and one person said, well, I don't eat seafood, you'd lose 10 customers. And so I just made sure that, and now, you know, dietaries and all the rest of it have come in. And so vegetarian food is, is, is amazing, is incredible. It's, you know, delicious and you don't have to be, you know, I, I remember being told, just give them some bloody vegetables and some pasta. You know, that used to be a vegetarian meal in a fine dining restaurant, but it's gone another level. And I think, with the use of spice and with my background, I've, I've managed to create a, 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 a bit of a niche for myself. Um, and I, I love that other people and other Sri Lankans are so proud that their national food is being represented in the, inter, in the international game. And that's really important to me. It's really important to represent, you know, whether it's Australia, whether it, it's great for me, I'm so lucky. I've got Australia, I've got Austria, I've got Sri Lanka, I've got England. You know, I can, I can, and I've got my a very hardcore French base, and I think all of that food is delicious, and it continually evolves. After after COVID, um, we came back, and you know, the it was pretty bad. There was there was a lot of a, a lot of hardship. We didn't know how many how we'd go, so I came into the kitchen myself. Uh, this is only a year and a half ago, and I prepared the entire menu, and I I did it with the mindset that this menu will only take five people eight hours a day to prepare and cook, right? That it would be make money, it would obviously be delicious, and it's my style of food. And so I prepped that entire, uh, it took me two weeks to come in, prep the entire thing. On the first day we opened, that's when the hotel decided it was okay to give me some staff. And so we started on the first day, those guys had done nothing. And one of the meat cook was sick. So I had to jump into the meat section and do that. And that's something I'm very proud of, Anthony, is that I am, I'm a cook. You can call me anything you like, but I'm a cook. And I have no issue still today. It hurts so much more. My knees are buggered, you know, all the rest of that as an old boy, but I can still cook and I can still do any section. I'm still a good, Greg taught me how to be a great pastry chef and I've never forgotten those lessons of simplicity and delicious and, you know, all of that um, meat and fish um, I've, I've always loved. And, you know, yeah, I can do any section. I love sauces. I'm a great sauce. Yeah. So that's, I guess that drives you too. And it, and it concerns me that we're not teaching any of that and that this whole I agree that we shouldn't work any more than anyone else. I don't, I don't agree that part of your, your training and everything should be working your ass off for nothing. That none of that makes sense to me. It, to me, it's more about being really well balanced, really well organized, saving money in some areas. And if you have to pay people a little bit more to work a little bit longer, then pay them if they want to be there to get the product that you want out. But I think it's so much about organization about um, you know you, you need the skills you need you need the knowledge my, I think I'm more useful now to people for my brain than my body but I tell you what I have a go I'm not scared but you know standing up for ten hours a day now isn't isn't as much I don't I don't just shake it off anymore but I do it but what 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 I have is this undying I don't know where it comes from undying enthusiasm and love for what I do and and. Um, that's that's still with me so hence Alba is born and I've stood there many times I was up at three o'clock this morning writing notes because I find if I can write things down and what were they I could they're, they're actually quite funny it's like uh, find someone for chemicals um, you know like just the simplest basic things but a guy said to me today on site he said you've done this so many times you probably won't forget all the little things and I and I know that you know you get into a new place you go, damn, should have had a PowerPoint there or damn, I should have done this, you know? And so I'm trying to tick off absolutely everything. And that's, it's exciting. It's enthralling. I'm actually at home as well at night, which is nice. Um, it's not going to be for long. My, um, my kids and, and my wife and I actually met at Bilson's. 
So she was 18. I was 26 and the head chef of this, this fine dining, you know, monster. And we're still together. We are still working together. We are, we are team Kuravita. She does all my marketing. She does everything. But I mean, up until now, because when I did my last five, five or six restaurants in the Pacific and, and here, it's always in conjunction with the hotel. So it's my IP. I set it up, you know, all that. I, I build the place, but I didn't have to think about employees or anything. So now I'm, as possibly my last foray, I'm employing people and learning all the new labor laws. And you know what? It's actually really good. It's like playing Lumosity. You just have to bring your brain. Yeah, they should have lumosity for chefs. Like, how many things do you need in the kitchen cupboard? Like, seriously, um, it's really good. Like, when I left the hotel, they imposed a one-year ban on me taking anyone that was there a month before I left and a month after, even if they've left. And when you get to big monsters, it's po it's pointless fighting them. You know, it's pointless. So I just said, fine. But in my spe farewell speech, once I had it, you know, once I cooled down and I thought about it, I thought, you know what, you've done me a favour because you know what you've made me do? You've made me think. You, you've made me not realize, rely on someone else. So, you know, if you bring a team with you, go, I remember what we did there. Remember that? Let's just do this. I have to teach everything from scratch to a whole new team of incredible people, which I'm actually, thankfully, already halfway to building, which is incredible in this environment but i feel like i've got a great group of people and i thank them in my farewell speech i said thank you very much you you've actually made me a better person and because of you i probably will be even more successful so i appreciate it thank you very much at the top of the show you mentioned neil perry opening margaret and you thought that he was a bit crazy at his age doing that and then here you are opening alba um what, why are you opening Alba and what, what, are we, what should we expect from it? Okay, well, well, so a year ago I found out that I wasn't going to stay with the hotel. So, you know, we've still got a 15-year-old. Um, we've still got a few bills to pay. And I thought, well, what are we going to do? And I, I said to Karen, my wife, whatever happens, I'm not going to open a bloody restaurant. So I was given um, by the guys at Stoddart have given me an entire show kitchen um, and I thought, great, I, I've always wanted to do a cooking school, so I'm going to open a cooking school. And so we started looking around this, the Sunshine Coast for a, for a site, and it, was, it wasn't that long ago, a year ago, and property prices, you know, like a, a good shed in, in an industrial area in Noosa used to be 180, 200 grand, now they're 700 grand. And so just, you know, I was thinking about my super and all of this stuff and what to do. So there was a big investment there anyway. And it was something I, I, I thought would be successful and would work very well. Um, so we were just looking and looking. And, I, and, and Alba's site is in Park Ridge, which is a, um, a beautiful housing area, which has just been developed. It used to be um, a sand mine. And the sand that came out of there was called Noosa White, hence the name Alba, which means white. Um, and so I went there five years ago. They said, here, we're building this. Do you want a restaurant? And I was like, no, I've got stuff to do. I got called back again six months ago and they said, look, we don't know what to do with this place. Do you want to come and have a look? Maybe you can help us decide what to do. So I walked through, it's 500 square meters, an amazing kitchen already sitting there and a, a, an incredible, super duper expensive, uh, pizza, pizza oven there. And it, it, the first thing that got me was it's like it's quite disjointed. It'd be really hard to run this and make any money. So I was sort of giving them some advice there. And I said, what's in that room? And they opened the door and it's 70 square meter space, empty. I said, that'd make a great cooking school. And the developer's eyes just went, yes, that would be amazing. That's what this area needs. Because within the 700 houses, luxury homes that are in that Noosa Springs area, um, there is nowhere to go and buy a loaf of bread or milk or, or, or any milk. You have to go to Noosa Junction, which is a 10 minute drive away. So then my mind started going, okay, all right. And we've got a resort license, which means we can have a bottle shop. So then I just started, well, well we can have a cooking school here. We'll move the pizzeria to them. We'll start a cafe and we'll do this in the morning. And then, you know, uh, there's nowhere to have coffee here. So when at, we'll open at six, we'll do this. And blah, 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 blah. Next minute, here we go. Um, and I got super excited. They got super excited. 
Um, they've given me a great deal on, um, on the terms of the business and the lease and everything like that. And I did some fig- figures and I thought, even if we get locked down, we will still be an essential service to these 700 homes. And that was really the, that was kind of the thing because we're still mid COVID, you know, and you guys are just coming out of lockdown and we haven't, and we're being a little bit, a little bit uh, complacent, I think, because, you know, we could be next. You guys could all be allowed to come up here and we might be closed, you know, and that, that has not, that, that hasn't escaped me. That is still certainly a hundred percent part of my thought process. And um, so this whole community, the hub, the the central place, the place to come and buy your milk and your provador and cooking for these guys and, you know, having Sunday meals for them to come and pick up. Everyone can drive around in a golf buggy. We've given everyone QR codes so they can order and come and pick up a pizza if they like. So basically I'm not opening a restaurant. I'm opening the world's most beautiful hotel lobby. So if you think about it that way, you walk into some really cool hotel. I've been into hundreds working with Dilma. I'm, I was traveling six months of the year, whether it was stuff I did for myself in my restaurants around the world, or whether it was going to the finest places in the world with Dilma and staying in these incredible hotels. There's only a couple of hotels that have struck me where you walk in the door and you look in the lobby and think, my God, what do I want to do first? Am I going to have a coffee in the cafe? Am I going to have a cocktail at the bar? Am I going to sit down and have a light meal? Shall I go into the fine dining restaurant? You know, there's a shop over there. Should I buy something? Oh, guess what? There's a cooking school. So that was the brief to Haley, the designer. And I just said, I want people walking in here going, what are we going to do first? Now, we've, we're surrounded by an acre of parklands, which is, you know, part of the common area for the, for the homes as well. All the, all the doors open up. Um, and even prior, the last operator who, who struggled a bit because of uh, design faults and stuff, which, which myself and the developers have now rectified. And they've put a lot of money into it. They've put a lot of faith into, into what this place could be, which is always good when you're working with people who understand. They're not stingy just after rent. They actually see that this investment of theirs could grow incredibly if we get it right and so they're being amazing with with and and that makes a big part of it i would not have signed this deal with these guys if that was if that wasn't the case and it's mine you know it's it's a it it, i guess there's a pride thing there but i'm not i'm not proud and stupid i've i've lost enough money i've i tell people you know i haven't i left school at 16 but um i've probably spent about half a million dollars on the best university degree ever and that's that's the, 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 the school of learning where you make mistakes and you lose money and then you realize, you know, I'd do that again. And so I've, I've done enough of those to, to think, uh, to have a look at that and think this is not a, I'm not doing this as a fantasy or as a, as a pride thing. I'm, I, I feel I have a viable business, whether it's during COVID and I know that it's going to be a great business after COVID. So I'm going to try and offer at the moment, we're looking after our guests, which are our residents, our people of our suburb, which is 700 homes, um, all luxury, expensive homes. And the thing is that the exodus from from, uh, Sydney and Melbourne, they've all ended up here. A lot of them have. And, you know, a lot of these, these beautiful housing developments, like Park Ridge was struggling to sell stage one, and they did. And then COVID hit and they just sold out straight away. So it's a great mix of people. It's not a retirement home. There are some, there are some retirees there who are super keen. I'm out there talking to them every day and finding out what they want. And I want it to be a community hub of a place where you can come and you can, you can do all kinds of things from just having a little bar snack to having a great, meal like what you know the the comments i got once i said i was leaving noosa beach i was like what are we going to do for the snapper curry don't worry it's coming you know but some of those dishes that i'm that i'm known for will definitely be there but i always work with chefs and try not to micromanage them and just say look this is the this is the playing field it's really large and wide let's come together i want you to be creative i want to promote you i want to make sure that you are also getting into that stage where the next step could be your own business or people start to get to know you. So I want to share all of that. And I always have, 
because running five restaurants at once in three countries remotely, if you didn't, if you did micromanage, you wouldn't succeed. So you have to trust the people you're with. And so hopefully we just come up with a, we, we have a, a, a product that people want to come to. It's, it's theirs. It's, it's your place. I'll be there. I'm not going anywhere. Um, I intend to give it a good shake and, and we'll see what happens. And, you know, if it fails, I've probably got enough money so that I don't lose my house and, um, you know, we can move on. And uh, maybe I should have done the retirement thing, but I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I really want to do this. I really want to make it. I want to make it the people's place. Um, it's not my place. It's just somewhere where everyone can come and have a good time. And uh, the food will be good and the drinks will be good and, you know, it'll be, it'll be a, a good hub. And the thing is that once we go back to normal, whatever that's going to be and whenever that is, then people will come. That's the thing. People will come through curiosity. They'll come because they've been once and they liked it. I mean, we had a good track record at Noosa Beach House. People, there's a lot of options in, in Hastings Street now, but people would come back to us three times on their week stay and just say, look, this is, this is the food we love to eat. I don't want to say this is the best place, but th those words were uttered occasionally. And, you know, that's, that's nice. That's a nice, a nice uh, compliment. And it's not me. I think that's the most important thing. It's the entire team and how they feel about coming to work and how they feel about working somewhere and working with someone. I don't think anyone works for me. People work with me. And when we can all work together, we're successful. That's my, that's my motto. Well, um, Peter, it's hard to capture the incredible influence that you've had over four decades on our culinary landscape. So I, I do think we should catch up again at some stage to hear more of your story. Good luck with Alba. It's sounding amazing and no doubt it'll be incredible given everything you've done in your career so far. Please keep in touch and um, we'll catch up again soon. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. And uh, yeah, it's, it's actually nice to be able to recount some of those things. I will start writing them down one day because it's a lot of fun, but I appreciate your time and thanks for having me on. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.